So one of the, I would say, kind of central tensions in my book, Little Pharma, much of which uh, takes place or takes off from um, the kind of emotional landscape of being a medical trainee in medical school and residency. One of the central tensions, I think, is that if one has a very um, aesthetic sensibility or nature, as, as it might, um, then uh, it's very um, confusing or entangling when you are um, in the world of the hospital or the clinic or the laboratory and um, see these um, marvels of um, the human form uh, and uh, one's kind of visual sensibility um, uh, kind of thrills to the beauty, even in things that are kind of horrible in sort of the delicate laciness of a rash or in the particular character of a wound or in the sort of nature of um, things that happen to the body in, in dying, for example. Um, and it's really hard to know what to do with that because I think uh, I tend to feel kind of a lot of guilt about whether this is sort of object objectifying the person or sort of detaching me from the experience in some way. Um, or whether on the other hand, you know, this is some part of my imagination that I need to embrace and use in order to better um, display or speak of so many of these um, chapters of life that are otherwise um, often kept hidden, particularly in the sort of modern way of American healthcare where, where sickness and um, death and suffering are, are often kind of uh, institutionalized or detached from the heart of our homes and communities. So. Anyway, that's just to say that that crops up in these poems and um, in this first one, which is um, sort of about a, a, a woman who arrives in the hospital as a patient and has a very uh, statuesque, um, but sort of terrible uh, appearance in her, in her suffering and in her trauma. This is called The Fall. You arrive crystalloid drips lounging off arms, single port of peridot drilled high beside collarbone, bathed in quills, rattling like singed paper, importuned by pain, its enameled antidote, fever, its chalky antidote, waking, its felted antidote, solitude, its monstrous antidote. Bride and groom sugar figures in candied opposition, clay-like, moody, naked like a ficus cutting, your one breathless idea, parlous, its clear bitter jar. Eyebrows, catgut stitches, right down to the shallow saucer expounding your ribs, right down the rounded fall-proof bed, canoe turned dry and drumming on its dock. Oh, let blow at your edges, your last long thought drawn bare. Respiratory rush of season's wind, season's last grass. And the next two poems um, are actually among the, the earliest in the book from medical school. And they take some of their imagery from the um, kind of classic quintessential moment in medical training where you and a team of other students are, are given a cadaver and you spend a semester or a year um, working on the same cadaver together and you develop an intimacy with it, which is um, odd and unlike, um, you know, any other relation to any other body that I've had. Um, and uh, can also be quite alienating to self, alienating to community to kind of keep crossing back into the world of, of the living and of normalcy. Um, and so this first one kind of captures that, that um, vertiginous sense of, of scale shifts. And it's called Little Farmer's Research. Sometimes when I leave the lab, what's outside seems some detail of anatomy still, as if always the metal gurney underlay the day. A man's jeans forming two blue veins coursing beside my bed. The lamp's sharp punctum where light spools under the fixture. Street noise leaking as through a weak wall in the heart. 
the anatomist's awe of layers above all. Five skins between work shirt and rectus abdominis, hardly different from my skipping flat rocks, minding the many ways they waft out and fall in, or my skyping an old lover, two skins, two apartments back. Of course, the reverse is just as true, like all of the brightest lies. In the lab, I meet the rest of life, all the world packed in one corpse, the body a kind of government, a flame red senate wrapped in fur. Its provinces, all fens and rivers, two-bit hucksters stamping wet booted outside the commissary store. Out along the farthest limbs, nerves open dove cuts for the wheeling flocks, homing, homing, home. When I first met my hands, their small largesse, they and I, we three, were amazed. In the lab's locker room, they peeled off my scrubs, glowed blue with a cold I couldn't yet feel, but knew as mine. Little match girls, little lights. What is there to love about this world without proportion? Impossible to tell if one body is two or five, to tell whether when I lie under my roof, it's about to slough right off, wizened epithelium, raw life lying beneath it, tasting the night as new syrup serum sky. And a sort of sister poem to this one um, is called Cadaver 28. And um, Ron took a chance on this one. I think this was, um, if not the very first poem that I published, it was very close, you know, among the first one or two. Um, and it felt terrifying even to, um, you know, send these off to to strangers. <laughs> um, and I felt very much like a greenhorn, which I was. Um, but but the kindness of Alaska Quarter Quarterly Review in, in making space for this work um, was was really seminal and, and gave me just a little bit of um, grit and, um, uh, you know, a, a grain of self-belief to, to get me going. So, um, Thank you. Um, and I'm so happy that this is in the book now. Um, and I'll just also say, uh, yeah, no, I don't need to over explain. <laughs> uh, this is about a cadaver, but also about the weird um, lines of thinking that one gets into when you spend too much time in a, in a lab full of cadavers. Cadaver 28. One. Male, pale dishwater color, hair of the former blonde boy. Now 60 something, still near six feet, weight declining each week as he is exposed. I try not to take it hard, he's less and less there every time I come to see him. I try to be gentle in case a soul part cares after it's all done. What I learn is parts, is a lessening. Pale signal lamps are his nails strewing declining light past my own dead hair my solid weight past my hard care. I know this body better than my own. How often have I said that and how often been wrong? And now at last, here it is, the known one, the solved, each piece petaled and glossy, transected and found out, fanned out for sight, parody of fidelity, obediently still and in all but color, precisely by the book. Such rigor of limb and frame, I am amazed its hair snips soft and easy in my hand when I am instructed to expose the neck. I am not at home in my hands, so I look down and make a thought's nest there. Mothy fasci wrap white around each form. A faint tang of olive rises from the yellow swells under the skin. I see all that can be seen, more than I have of any man alive. And of course, see nothing not available to sight. Two, he entered my dreams with the grim sachet of a pickup artist. My legs are tired. I've been running through your head all night. Say I see his wife alone at a grocery till, pulling lint from a good coat or raising coffee to her lips, seated across from a grown daughter in a glass fronted cafe. Will the tips of my fingers chill? to some word whispered from the ditch below my throat, soft, hard to catch, something like occult, adult, a dust, adulterous. 
He has a blue mole along the beach of his ear. Pre-auricular Venus Lake, I should say. I would know her by the swimmer's hunch, the spring brimming under her feet. He has the averted face of one hearing confession. I would know her by the red beads encrusting the lights in her matchbook. I would know her by the beads on her lip. I am like his shadow, long and constant all winter. She, the parlor mirror, flinging beams without his face in her facets, his, her witness, his, her white light. I spray his feet to stop them drying out. The way they keep turning into spindled rinds of kabocha, pitted meteorites, or the penitential rasp of winter concrete would be strange to her. He has a silence. I would know her by her hungry ears. Three. I half awoke to yellow light in a gray room, combination so mucus it caught my breath. My real man of the moment slept. Cadaver, cadaver 28, interred down the street, sent me word. Toad-sized human hearts tumbled against my porch. Valentines straight from pathology. Embossed conversation candy messages chattering across them. Pink ink, all caps, see me. Dreaming of Cupid as a defibrillator, the smug little archer, the peel off current pads. Drop me a line. Cadaver 28, I'm coming. My real man kept sleeping. Number 28 entered my dreams and laughed. Dead legs don't tire, don't run either. Four. Like birds, invisible until they move, his death. Each yellow eye, quiet and absorbed on its branch, near weightless as a mood. Once, when I worked the grit of a motel key to enter a room in Pocatello, Idaho, mid-March, snowing, 3 a.m., what awaited shed the same oyster light as that sunless lab. He flattens where he touches the steel table, again a tiny boy, mashing his cheek to the bus window, feeling the engine stroking the yellow hull and unfurling into his bones. Again, the boy puzzling at the TV's colicky blurps, alone in early morning on a failing channel, pressed against velvety static, squinting at the snow inside the box. Okay. Um, I was trying to make sort of a through line among a selection of poems. So I've picked sort of a number of ghost ghost poems, which I guess is okay since we're nearing Halloween, but um, it isn't the only mood in the book, but uh, it, it's helpful to make a little necklace for tonight of some poems that, that kind of speak to each other. And um, so this next one um, is called Little Pharma Sees Ghosts. And again, it's, it's a little bit about being haunted by um, bodies one has seen, deaths one has seen, and the um, pervasive sense of um, uh, guilt or um, fear of having having misstepped, having missed missed something that uh, can can give someone me uh, you know sort of a sense of being pursued by the underworld at moments. Little Pharma sees ghosts. The ghosts crackle. They are breaking in, being seasoned like leather or iron. Their new task: minding her a fussy tremor like a moth sack. The white was just outside her, the breathing in cupped wool on her tongue. Who trains them? They are so close even now, and when they are more supple. If she had ordered blood at six and again at nine, if she had felt for a liver when the eyes rolled back, minding her, fussing and pointing like the mothers of foreigners, their dishes are monstrous and alkaline. If she had seized the pupils of the eyes, measured their mismatch, cold dime and colder nickel, who breeds them? They are not real and they are even closer. They are even, they are untippable, correct. If she had accounted unusual weights, conversions, blood types, telemetry, hypsometry, catastration, straw poles, questionnaires. As they season to leather and iron, they begin to smell Closing her eyes only brings them out. As is said of the blind and music, as is said of the blind and the dullest items, 
when will the carpet dry, is the stove on. They are supple, the size of seals, rolling. Who fattens them? Who stepped outside with them? Their white breathing is wooling her. She must be kept dry or she will shrink. She crackles with lanolin. All of the mouths, not hers, trilling together tip on tip, close and correct as a leather brown nest. So um, you will have noticed that, that um, many of these poems are kind of from the voice of an alter ego uh, called Little Pharma, which was really helpful as a way to um, refract my own experience and feel free to um, fictionalize it, mythologize it, um, uh, give it, you know, opinions and voices and overtones that are that are not mine or not always mine. Um, and uh, my very first uh, little pharma poem uh, was was this one. Little pharma. Of the many impossible chemicals, we need the one whose freeze state speeds the road, then warms to wet commitment on the windows. We need the one in small jars that grows big as remorse to float us down canals, flayed straight beyond intention. All the foams I know stuff walls or clean, hold heat or lay bare the face. Bring me the other white whip that shames and elates the hungry carpets of medians. Bring me the acid that inflames Ohio's battery, then the one for Pittsburgh. As yet, the one serum for travel dries the mouth, locks the far hills like a bone plate. There is nothing for the shrift of your elbow, the hands at 10 and two. When you are drunk, you touch my face as though it were made of cities and you were a bobcat's toe. There's that much fear of pulsed light and flare of how joy can be timed like a well-run boulevard you'd rather screw the moon. I know I've been waiting to be happy. Foolish when you see how cabs coast the stop line, how they believe in green before it blinks a fern eye on their rusted skins. Foolish when you catch the furred backs rising out of the park, the half seen night snouts sliding across the road towards God knows what sweet, what slip of meat brine, in appointed cans and alley boxes at the brink of anyone's home. Heather, how strict are we about the end of our hour? Should I wrap up or um, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think we're too strict. Are, are we, Ron? It's up to no, you. I think, but, I think you should read and then we should I still think have you should a, read and, and Ron will get to ask this question. And we'll, we'll okay. if it's all right with you, Patty Ann, um, you know, we, I think we can go another maybe 15 minutes tops. Will that work, Ron, that for you? for me. And That's will that work, I assume, for the museum too? Because this is really special and I'm really it's uh, enjoying it. And, and it's very, um, the, the poems, uh, the language and the, it, it's very symbiotic. I mean, you, you, as Ron said, you, you go well together. So uh, yeah, go ahead is the, is the long and short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. Thank you. Okay, I was I was going to read two more, so I will do that. Um, there there is a, a suite of poems um, scattered throughout the book called um, "Imagining Marriage," and I, I echo Patty Ann's sentiment that um, I often write poems when I don't know what I think, and I sort of write my way towards towards thinking. Um, and so, uh, you know, "Imagining Marriage" was sort of different ways of looking at relationships, commitment, trying to figure out, you know, is this for me or not? Um, spoiler, spoiler alert, it was. <laughs> My partner and I are married now, but uh, maybe the poems helped. And uh, yeah, so this first one was really kind of about the idea of whether it is scary or elating to think of um, the a certain dissolution of the self as kind of the most important atomic unit and, and letting that go and, and kind of making the fundamental unit be, um, you know, a, either a couple or a community or something kind of larger than oneself as a project. So this helped me think about that. Imagining marriage. The bellies of right whales, 
each krill its jacket of mineral, one meal. The empties on Tillman Street, what they will make is in their next heat is maybe a whale's glass cage, is maybe the largest bulb in Reno, is certainly a gray rash of nickels. Hello, goodly transmutation. Hello, my onus, my many. Two can be many. One can be two. At any siren, I still hail Mary, the pastor's way of saying thy womb like thyroid, fast and ill-accounted, though now I am praying to the box of noise, the string of women mimicked in its hosing peel, the low one with her black nose gay, the central matron strong as steel-cut oats, the soprano hem on fire, parched red, smoke gingered. All these are you, says the ambulance, when not saying the more important move. And yet to reduce, to make a vichyssoise of the large Babylonian heart, a feat and all that ends in feet. Oh, thick rue, dumb as Napoleon in the goat hills of his mind, weaving one scratchy blanket for two or three hundred million backs. We are apart, apart. Yet how good and still the bed can feel as you tug at my hair, a thousand brown filaments, a single greased bobbin. How unreal to grab so much together. Today in a space movie, a man in orbit tapes long strips of paper to his air shaft out of dying to hear the Russian grass. To you, it is all a sick dalliance with ghosts. Me, I want those streamers. I'm ready to glue them all over the house, drowning out even our shared and sleeping dog, our real trees, so that always it can be said, our listening is to splits and shards, is in pieces. And I will read just one more. Um, and uh, although it's not from that suite, I think it has a similar concern. Um, something I wrote about um, for Poetry Magazine, sort of about my almost obsessive preoccupation with kind of litanies of the dead during the pandemic and this urge to kind of list everybody, count everybody up. Um, and uh, here I go into that a little bit, um, which I think is maybe a doctor's impulse, even, even pre-pandemic. I think we're kind of constantly counting, counting noses all day, make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, and it, it also kind of ties that into the really beautiful passages in the, the gospel about, um, uh, you know, God having, uh, you know, the, the enough attention to note, you know, every sparrow, every uh, lily of the field, etc. The countable. To be among the countable, be scant as bird in air. Oily mutter of unreaping wing is enough. Dropping seeds that plants may dumbly grow is enough. Slamming glass, shiner to shine, when your bill hits porch window, your phantom rival flared up and gone, sore head, be master of thump and ding. That is enough to be counted in books of the living, may be saved by a nut brown hand, suet buffed, brought to a bosom of happy enumeration. I was doing my best at the breakfast table with boxed cornflakes and the last slug of milk when the first bird dropped heavy as a child's trophy, its ember soaking air from my yard. It seemed my job to take note, its glass skewed wing, its sacral rage. In case I was the Count's one deputy that day, what a god of suffering, I pulled the shade. I was ringing laps in a Sunday night grocery, everything smudged in the old week's rouge, soft in my belly as an oyster making love. It seemed no one could note as I did the dusty pecking of a man at the free cheese tray, how he studied the prices of Capicola, took four toothpicks of Swiss, swizzled his brow, took seven more. Of course, I only watched with no idea which of Knight's Tolman charged him on the cold walk home. Of course, there is a count. Of course, there is a shining booth where tickets are redeemed for fuzzy things, or simply someone holds your hand under a butter moon, tells you of your five fingers, whispers that even a sixth would be beautiful on you, 
even a hand known to claw after gym cracks, beautiful. The toothpicks trailed him like frost at the edge of a department store fire, wholly white and still, while his ground floor of perfumes wrapped hoods of burnt sugar on the speechless. If I cotton on to an ultimate mercy, it is one of two-ply robes and hammered velvet, the kingfisher humming talus to the sunset, sure, but also many thin clerks and reeves, nervous to exist, an attic of abacuses, dozing in crackalore, a little behind time in their contributions, flocked with eraser tongues. If I fall after you, it is because of the baked Alaska in my chest, which wants to be a tower of alternating pains snugged in cloud, but is running from an unplanned heat. It's several colors streaming from the base. Count them. Before they mix to gray-brown, they are yours. Thank you so much.